and my name is uh, Johannes Fofas. I'm a senior principal software engineer at Volvo Cars and one of the drivers uh, of Zool at our company. So uh, Zool is the default uh, CI toolchain uh, at Volvo Cars and uh, it started uh, as a bit of a, like a garage project or a small project. Uh, but over time, uh, it expanded, and I think one and a half year ago, uh, we became uh, the default CI toolchain. So new, new software teams starting new projects with the source code that goes into the car are advised to use Zool. And uh, down here in the picture, uh, you can see some of the main components we have. And we almost only use Garrett as code review. Uh, we have a little bit of GitLab, uh, but yet no GitHub. We kind of said no to GitHub uh, because we have enough uh, uh, issues or challenges as it is. Uh, yeah, and we use AVS and Azure as cloud providers, and we run our backend in Kubernetes of Zool. Yeah, so uh, we had a massive grow rate, or at least in our terms, massive. Uh, we have uh, two small teams uh, that handle uh, and work with Zool, among many other things, so to say. We also, they also define uh, base jobs and some SDKs and test environments, uh, uh, a whole lot. So we went from uh, yeah, around 200 projects to over 600. And uh, this uh, really, we were, uh, we were lucky, actually, that Zool version 5 came and that our colleagues uh, who I heard listened to earlier from BMW, they engaged in that work. So we, we really needed it too. Yeah, this is a plot of our node usage. Um, I think the tip here is static nodes and the rest are dynamics. And uh, we try to get rid of all static nodes, uh, but they they are like our rucksack or uh, heritage and that we are trying to work away from. I mean, we, we used to have real bare metal nodes uh, everywhere, and then we have uh, our own server rooms. But as I think the rest of the industry, uh, we try to use uh, clouds, cloud. Uh, and um, this is our uh, node usage. I just took some random Grafana samples uh, to look at uh, OpenDev. Uh, and we, we are not really large. I mean, we, it's quite small in comparison, but still, uh, for, for me, it's uh, a lot <laughs> to handle. Um, yeah, so here you can see that we, I think we average, um, fairly average on 150 uh, nodes on operating hours. And the mm, executed queue is around 180. Maybe, yeah, average 150, and open dev, yeah, way, too, way more. And here are our build stats. Um, we build around, I think, I haven't take, taken an average, uh, but I think we average around 4,500 uh, jobs per 24 hours, so not per hour. <laughs> um, yeah, and here are some uh, stats of our checking gate for one of our tenants, uh, the major one. And yeah, you can see when there are weekends and when there are releases, it's heavy. As I said uh, this morning, uh, we won the Volvo Cars Technology Award. Uh, and uh, this is really something that uh, means a lot to us because uh, every employee within, in, within Volvo Cars can vote. And we never thought we were going to win this among all the other teams. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, uh, that was really, really nice. When you start as a grassroots movement and you win technology award for a CS system, uh, yeah, that's, I think, yeah, really nice. Yes, and uh, we use Acme gating a lot. Um, I would like us to contribute more to the open source project with our developers. Uh, so far, uh, we, I mean, last year we haven't had any time, basically. But 
uh, we have a nice cooperation with James, uh, which provides us with uh, uh, custom images. And uh, uh, as he said this morning, uh, sometimes we get our features that we really need before they're released upstreams, and sometimes uh, we wait with upstream releases because maybe, I mean, sometimes we're in a critical phase in some project, and we don't dare uh, to do anything. I mean, yeah, maybe it's stupid, but that's how we operate. Uh, and some of the things that James has developed for us is uh, improved Azure drivers and improved uh, metrics. Mm. Yeah, the uh, optimized reconfigurations and something called semi-dynamic uh, nodes. Uh, and this is like a, a dynamic uh, node with a timer. And because of the proprietary license models we have on some of our systems, uh, it's, it's, it's much easier for us to have a, a something in between static and dynamic nodes. And the same thing goes for the enterprise-wide semaphore. Uh, one, one of the problems we had when we just poured in projects from everywhere uh, was that we needed to keep, uh, keep them in one tenant if they used the same proprietary license, like a compiler license. And that wasn't really a good idea. I mean, um, that, when I talked to James, uh, that wasn't really how Zool was intended to be used. Uh, so, I mean, now um, we solved our issues. We have solved our performance issues. But we, we have the enterprise-wide semaphore so we can share uh, important licenses and not have that as a reason to keep people in the same tenant. Or more, more, we like to keep them in the same tenant if they really belong together, if their software modules belong together. Yeah, and this is a, a picture, uh, me trying, or our team trying to describe how we operate still at the moment. So, yeah, James uh, drives. And I heard uh, during this conference uh, many times people um, explaining uh, the, I mean, the main principle of Zool. And, and for us, when we uh, migrated to version 3, uh, we did that with the uh, um, knowledge in mind that our new generation of cars would have a full ecosystem of nodes. And they all, or many of them, have dependencies. So, uh, I mean, if you remember, I said that uh, we were like a grassroots movement and we wasn't the default uh, CI chain to start with. So people came from all different kind of CI systems. And then, uh, I mean, finally, uh, for our core computer that we have in our car, in the middle here, uh, we just, on a company level, decided that all modules that go in there should be, uh, should be used in Zool. Uh, so then, in that situation, I mean, we, we really needed to use the dependent, uh, dependency function, both uh, where people can state it in their work, but also uh, stating their dependencies in their actual jobs, like, okay, my, my, my thing here actually depends on these projects. And that, I think, is the, what really makes Zool important for us, that teams can collaborate, they can depend on each other's changes, uh, and still pass through checking gate. Uh, and uh, w the different modules, I mean, we have a lot of, they have a lot of dependencies uh, between each other. Uh, here is an example of uh, how we use uh, Sul's uh, dependency management to do a rebuild. Uh, so uh, in this example, uh, we have a C++ base tech library. Uh, and we want to upgrade that because that gives us new features in a software stack. And uh, what then happens, so in this picture we have Basetech CI, they use Jenkins, and they provide the library. And we have uh, an integration repository in Git. And when they change, when, we, when you want to change the version, we change, we have a manifest where we change the version, and that triggers uh, a rebuild in Zool. And when the rebuild is, rebuild is ready, uh, we build a binary and we test it in, uh, in, many, in many instances, but we mainly test it in a 
uh, hardware in the loop setup that I will show a picture of. Yes, uh, so um, all these modules have complex uh, dependencies. I just made some uh, drawings here to show. Uh, this is a small test branch. Uh, this isn't, isn't hundreds of modules because then you wouldn't be able to see anything. Um, and here uh, on the side, you see uh, Zool's uh, user interface where uh, when the jobs are ready, you get this uh, time graph. And I, I really appreciate it when this came into uh, Zool web. And here you can see, uh, yeah, so in this dependency graph, we start to build from the bottom of the stack, and then we rebuild further. We build uh, the stack upwards. So I tried to show this with some kind of animation. So when the lower layers are built, we build the dependent layers. Uh, and this is done then automatically. So the developer, developers, they state their dependencies in the repos, and then they are prepared for automatic rebuilds. Uh, yeah, and here we have another uh, module up here, which has all the dependencies downwards in the stack. And they, of course, all these modules can belong to different teams in their different Garrett instances and maybe different type of repos. It could be GitLab, uh, but mainly it's uh, Garrett. And um, yeah, of course, uh, from my perspective, we are working, or our vision is to have this instantaneously. So whenever a module is updated, uh, we automatically rebuild the dependencies to see, okay, does this work or not? But we, we are not there yet. Uh, we're not there. So this is what we had in the meantime. And the performance, uh, I mean, uh, before we had this, it took like a week to do these tests because people uh, had to uh, you know, talk with each other and check, oh, I have dependency to your things, and I had to build it in the right order and do, the, do it like, yeah, basically traverse up the graph or the dependency stack. Uh, but now it takes three and a half hours uh, to, do, to rebuild all the modules uh, we have. Uh, so that, I mean, from our perspective, it's, it's a great improvement, and it really made the developers happy. Yes. So um, this is a picture of, um, that I took from uh, the official Volvo Cars webpage. Uh, it shows uh, basically that we have a, a lot of sensors in our future or platforms, the platform that we work with. And we have many different hardware in the loop setups. Uh, we have uh, setups for vehicle motion control, both longitudinal and lateral. Uh, and we have for autonomous drive and uh, ADAS, protective safety, and so forth. And there we have both component and domain test setups. So the simple ones are basically uh, an, a node or two with a smaller setup, uh, but the large ones, I have a picture of here, that's part of the rig, have real radars and real cameras uh, for object identification, and so forth. Yeah. And uh, we have systems both from natural instruments and uh, deep space mm. run this, including yeah, scenario generators uh, and vehicle models. So I think it's quite, I mean, it's quite close to the real deal, but it's in a controlled environment. So uh, whenever we, we made, uh, we have triggers uh, and we build the whole stack. We test it here and ensure or check how well it grows. Uh, here is uh, another use case, uh, what we run in Zool, uh, and we started to do this quite recently. Uh, here we have a, a compiled simulation platform for active safety that they call CSBoss. And um, it's, it's a, a special uh, setup uh, where they um, combine different modules uh, in a different way than we have in the owner software, and, com and uh, combine it with uh, world engines and vehicle simulators. Uh, and we also have an open scenario and open drive and a scenario generation engine that we can feed and create driving scenarios. And for ADA, this is uh, very important. 
Uh, and then we have uh, some software plugins that communicate with DDS. And this uh, setup we get from our uh, uh, supplier, Sensec, and they are actually here today. Yes, hi, hi, <laughs> Sensec. Uh, and when we get the delivery, uh, which actually through some gateways enters our artifactory, we trigger on that. And then we have some uh, test cases that are evaluated with PyTest. Um, yeah. And here are some links for those interested and some contact names. Uh, I have some colleagues who uh, work with this. And uh, ES Mini is quite nice. Uh, it's an open source uh, project that we, our, my colleagues, contribute to. And here is also links to the Open Scenario page. Uh, another interesting um, thing we drive in Zool, I mean, we drive, we run a lot of things. Um, I mean, we run C++, C, unit tests, and compilation jobs, and so forth. But we also run uh, uh, some other things, and this is the one that I think is really interesting. Uh, it's a domain uh, software stack. Uh, so uh, here we have the source codes. Uh, and that we, we build and compile in Zool anyway. Uh, and then we have a supplier virtual ECUs that we get. Uh, so we, with our suppliers, we often uh, negotiate to get uh, seal simulations to be able to run. So we can connect our source code to. And we have both supplier and in-house uh, models, for instance, prop uh, propulsion systems, brakes, steering models, and so forth. And that is then combined. So uh, these, these models here use uh, Silver and Test Weaver from Synopsys. And it's all run in CarMaker, which is a multi-body CIE simulation environment. And uh, <coughs> it's used to kind of smoke test functionality. Uh, and and the, the really nice thing with this, with this system is that it's a kind of verification of the software because the fidelity here is quite high. You can actually see real problems in brake systems uh, virtually. Uh, and uh, I think it's really impressive that the team uh, have it as a gate and release job in Zoo. Um, so they can actually keep track of the real functionality out that we experience in the car. And they run it through Zool. And they also use Zool for their setup of uh, the actual models in the framework. That's using Zool too. Yeah, our current setup is uh, Zool version 5. Uh, we have uh, six schedulers and 10 executors. And we tried to, uh, we, we increased it slowly basically. When we saw that we had performance issues, we had to improve. And uh, the back end is run in a EKS Kubernetes cluster. Uh, at the moment. Yes, our, um, our biggest challenges, uh, I have two slides on that. Uh, one is that uh, when we onboard new teams and they have maybe have a small Jenkins setup, they just say, Zool is slow. You know, I pushed my change and I have to wait a minute or, or, or two or five. Uh, you know, what's this? I want to I execute immediately. Um, and then we have to tell them, yeah, but you know, we have this rebuild thing. You're listening to a lot of repositories. Uh, uh, so we had, we had some issues uh, with this. Uh, I have, don't have any graphs when it was bad, but it could take, uh, um, I mean, 10, 15 minutes for a short while. Uh, and we had, some, we had some real issues there. Um, so here, what we have in this plot is part of the upstream plots that we get, event job time. Which is the time, uh, which is the time between uh, when Zool sees the trigger, the event, before the first job starts. So I think that's a good, for me, it's a key metric to keep track of how long do the developers have to wait. And I think, yeah, for our biggest tenant, we 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 have times around, yeah, one and a half minutes maybe. Uh, for the smaller tenants uh, that we now. Uh, uh, created. I mean, when we had these issues, we, we actually did a job to uh, divide 
the different uh, users in uh, more tenants where we could. And of course, in those smaller tenants, the uh, event job times are uh, smaller. Um, we also got uh, some uh, nice optimization uh, job from James, and this uh, actually really helped. Uh, and and uh, we, since we have monitors of the reconfiguration times, we just saw that you know, it improved enormously. <coughs> and I think that when we were around 600 projects, we went to some kind of critical mass where the system just almost broke. Uh, because people were, uh, you know, they were uh, starting up new software teams, they were messing about with their uh, job configuration YAML files, and all those little things um, just caused reconfigurations. So uh, while we worked on it, I was actually sitting a few days, just sometimes dequeuing jobs if they were doing uh, like really rush hours. I was sitting there like, oh, uh, maybe we can run this later. And I just contacted the team, shaking their gear, it's like, oh, uh, let's, let's wait for this. But yeah, so we had, we had, a, we had uh, I think, one week where we really struggled, but now after that, it has went quite well. Uh, we also have the global semaphore developed by James, and this is because we use uh, proprietary licenses for compilers and uh, some of our test frameworks. And uh, we don't want to put uh, software teams that d don't have anything in common in the same tenant just because they share a license. So this really helps us to uh, keep them separated uh, and keep our system uh, faster. Yeah, uh, this is another challenge. Uh, this is a, a graph of the number of support issues we have. We use uh, discourse internally. We have an, uh, our own discourse server. And uh, yeah, uh, it's a lot. So uh, at times, uh, our Zool CI teams, and myself included, work with support. And, and uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah it's, it's a challenge, uh, but it's getting better. Um, I think since many years ago, we had the approach that we tried to find these small islands, you know, always there is someone in the team which has uh, some interest in DevOps. And sometimes some teams have dedicated DevOps. So we talk to them, try to get to know them, and we teach them. And when they show that you know, they can really handle the situation, we give them more and more privileges. And I mean, usually, after a while, they have their own tenants and they have their own admin rights. Uh, and then we just talk about you know, what should we do with the, uh, how, what should we request for, or what should we develop on a larger scale. Uh, but it is, a, it is a real challenge uh, for us, this. Yeah, our future. Uh, we want scalability uh, for our worker nodes, uh, and we want Kubernetes. And I think a week ago, we just got that. Uh, so we run that in the same cluster as we run the backend. So for simple Python uh, jobs, uh, we now run, uh, run it in our cluster. And we're investigating ways to run more complex uh, containers, maybe containers within containers, uh, to be able to run that uh, in a cluster. Uh, and we also want, in our, I mean, in our roadmap, if we get the chance, we would like to uh, not be uh, fully dependent on AWS, but to have a switchable backend to Azure. So like a Boolean switch, like, OK, uh, <coughs> I want to switch now for some reason, we, we should be able to do that. And we also got requests uh, to run Zool jobs in uh, OpenShift uh, HPC computing cluster. Um, and yeah, we're investigating the drivers uh, for those, and that's uh, nice. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, my clock here says we still have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Oh, there are so many examples. Uh, I think uh, it's very common with questions on the base jobs. So we always try to set up a base job. I mean, if we, if we use Google tests, for instance, we have a base job for that. 
uh, to build a certain on a certain binary, and, and it's always questions on, you know, okay, I have this base job, but now I want to modify it. And people are not used to Ansible, <coughs> and uh, yeah, so that's a lot of questions. Uh, also, uh, I always or I often tell folk to use the Nuke job. Uh, we have it many in the documentation, but use use the Nuke job when you bootstrap your new repos because usually people just define a lot of jobs or copy something and then they sit there and say uh, nothing happens like you know why why doesn't my job start uh, so that's a very uh, common thing uh, but for the more experienced devops uh, it's usually uh, we have discussions on on their actual how they define their jobs and where they should be stored uh, and how to solve complex problems where uh, sometimes they come and say, hey, I want to enable circular dependencies. We try it like, mm, mm, no, I don't want that. <coughs> so those kind of uh, questions are common. Okay. Thank you very much.